want to talk to you about how Jesus would encourage us on our bad days, be forgiving, be forgiving. You know, during 2008, we were building our Little Creek campus, and it was quite a feat, I could say it that way, and many of you that were part of the church remember that. It was a unique time uh, because we were in a global recession, and we're building this building. It started before that happened, and there was uh, an institution that had promised us uh, some things, and uh, when the economy changed, uh, there was conversations that we had, and there were two particular individuals. I remember we were on a conference call, and I just distinctly remember they just were dishonest. And I remember in that conversation saying, "Say, time out, this is not what you guys said. This is actually just the opposite of what you said. And of course, our whole team agreed with that. We all felt the same way. And yet, and yet they maintained this was, well, we've changed, well, you know. And, and I remember on the inside of me, I remember welling literally up on the inside. I thought to myself, you are so wrong. The conversation ended and we basically ended that relationship. And, and I remember that something really happened on the inside of me. There was this like this developing unforgiveness and almost like a little seed of bitterness because I felt like you were unjust, you were wrong, you lied, you changed things, you were dishonest. About a week later after that, I remember in prayer one morning, just distinctly the Holy Spirit literally just coming over me and speaking to me because I just felt this kind of heaviness for a week. You know when you have unforgiveness in your heart, I mean, it affects your whole life. And I remember the Holy Spirit just putting his finger and said, Steve, you have unforgiveness. I want you to forgive those two guys. And I went through what I'm going to teach you today. I literally verbally said, I forgive. And I said the person's name and I forgive. And I literally felt a release in my life. I want to talk to you today about the power of forgiveness. If you have your Bible, we've been teaching through the Gospels, looking at different accounts. Luke chapter 20. Three, Luke chapter 23. The scripture says this, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. In review, we have been talking the last five weeks about the last words that Jesus made from the cross. How did he end up at the cross? Why did he need to go to the cross? Those of you that remember, it's not as, maybe it's not as seen as readily as it was when I was a kid, but in the football games, you'd see people would hold up big signs, right? They would hold up those big scripture signs, John 3.16. I don't know if they've been banned in stadiums, but, but so as a kid, you would see these, somebody would hold up these big signs, John 3, 16. Matter, matter of fact, why don't we just recite that all of our locations? It's, it's this, for God so what? So love the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We've seen that. Americans have seen that. We've seen that scripture, and it's really the culmination. This moment at the cross was all about that scripture. For God so loved the world that you and I, that he gave, that he gave his only, his only begotten son, that King James would say, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He was born of a virgin, Mary. That was a miraculous birth. He grew up, and, and, and we know in that Galilean region in Nazareth, that, and then he makes the announcement that he, he reads the scroll in the synagogue and makes the announcement that, that this day the scriptures fulfill. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bind up, to heal, to love, to care, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. His ministry begins when he goes down to the Jordan River. We, we, we've talked about that as he's baptized by his cousin John, and the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus. And then miracles start happening. What miracles? Blind eyes are opening and deaf ears. And he loves people. He embraces often the outcast, those that are on the periphery of society, those that are on the margins. He casts out devils. He heals lepers. He does things that were unimaginable. 
He does things that are supernatural. He multiplies fish and bread. People are amazed by his teaching and his miracles. And then he has a supper with his friends. He'd gathered his 12 guys together. The eve of Passover, the actual eve of when the next day the sacrificial lambs would take place. And he has this last moment with them. And in this last moment, he talks about for this purpose. By the way, he's been telling them the whole time, for this purpose I've come, for this purpose to die, to give my life a ransom for many. Later that night, he's betrayed by one of his own. Think about it. It's, it's tough when somebody who you don't know does something wrong to you. It's real tough when somebody you do know. He sold for 30 pieces of silver. Then the trials begin, right? Then there's Caiaphas' trial and, and all the Jews, they're, they're accusing him of blasphemy. He declares himself to be the son of God. And, and yet there's, there, there's, they're going from trial to trial to trial. And it's, and it's, it's actually a mock rig trial. And, and then he goes to Pilate early in the morning and Pilate's like, hey guys, what do you want me to do? And they're like, well, it's blasphemy and it's high treason. And he declares himself to be king of the Jews. You guys remember what Pilate said? Here's what he said. He goes, he actually washes his hands and he goes, to be honest, guys, I find no fault in this man. In other words, he's innocent. Everybody say innocent. He's innocent and yet he's dying as a guilty criminal between a guy on the right and a guy on the left. An innocent man dying, but, but he was dying for a purpose. He was dying for the purpose, for this purpose, the Son of Man has come. And oh, after Pilate, you know what happened. They put a crown of thorn on his head and, and they start punching him and whipping him. And, and all of those imaginable things, whether you've read it in the Gospels or you've seen it in movies, it is gruesome. They punch him, they command him, prophesy, they blindfold him. Tell us who hit you, O King of the Jews. And then he was so broken down physically that he actually had to get, they had to get somebody to help him carry the cross up to Gol Golgotha. And then they, they raised him on the cross. And as they raised him on the cross, an innocent man, I find no fault in him. An innocent man dying for the sins of the world. What would you say if you were innocent, you'd done nothing wrong, nothing that your accusers say, nothing wrong, what would be the first words that would come out of your mouth? If those that were mocking you, that were accusing you, that were ridiculed, they were all right there, and you were raised up, what would be the first thing that you would say? I've been through some tough situations. You've been through some tough situations. I wonder, I wonder if when we're going through tough situations, I wonder if the first thing that crosses our mind is actually the first thing that Jesus said. And it was a prayer. Listen to what he said. It's the first words recorded from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Could you imagine, could you imagine how relationships would change if that was the first words that were uttered in a conflict? Father, forgive them. Father, could you imagine husbands and wives? Forgive my husband. Forgive my wife. I mean, right in the middle of, could you, could you imagine in your work? Can you imagine if we actually said the words of Jesus? Those are the first words he uttered. Before anything else on the cross, he was teaching us something. He was modeling something for us. Father, forgive them. It's actually a prayer. I want to talk to you about the significance of the prayer of Jesus from the cross. Three things about it. Number one, why was this prayer significant? Number one, because it fulfilled biblical prophecy. Jesus fulfilled prophecy. Again, if you weren't here the last couple of weeks, I'll say this again. The Old Testament, there are over 300 what's called prophecies of the coming Messiah, where he was going to be born, what he was going to do. This is one of the 300. So when he died on the cross, 
He actually fulfilled prophecy. This is fulfilled in the person of Christ. Here it is. You guys ready? Number one, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 20, or verse 12. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. In other words, he was right amidst the criminals. He was innocent. He was guilty. He was guilty. He was innocent. But he was numbered among the transgressors. You ever been a part of something where like everybody else really did the wrong thing and yet, and yet you were actually taking the rap for them and you were innocent? He was numbered among the transgressors. He was innocent, but he was being crucified as a criminal. Yeah. The scripture goes on to say this. It says, and he bore the sin of many and made, what's that next word? Can we all say that? All of our locations, I want to say the I word. This is important. What's that next word at the count of three? One, two, three. Intercession. He made intercession for the transgressors. Think about it. He didn't curse this man. He didn't curse the Roman soldiers. He didn't curse his accusers. He didn't curse all of those that put him on the cross. The Bible actually said he made intercession for them. What is intercession? Intercession is it's standing in the gap in prayer. He actually prayed for those that were persecuting him. He actually, he, he, he prayed for those that were abusing him. When you think about the reality of Jesus praying for his offender, those that hurt him, and what was he praying? The power of prayer, uh, the power of Father, forgive them. How, how many times when we get in a situation, how, how many times have we lost sight of the power of standing in prayer for those that have hurt us? He was numbered among the transgressors, and he made intercession for them. Number one, Jesus' prayer on the cross, it signified the fulfillment of prophecy. Number two, Jesus modeled the importance of prayer. I love teaching through the Gospels. I love teaching about the parables of Jesus. And matter of fact, I, I taught the Beatitudes a number of years ago. I taught every one of them. I, and, and I taught the Sermon on the Mount. I, I love the teachings of Jesus. I've done series on the miracles of Jesus the sayings of Jesus. I talked about the I am statements of Jesus. But what I love about Jesus is Jesus actually begins his ministry teaching on prayer. And he ends his ministry teaching on prayer. Matter of fact, one day he was, he was going away in the morning and his disciples, they were like, man, where are you going in the morning? The Bible says that he actually would get up early before the other disciples. And the Bible says long before daylight, and he would go in, in different places. And, and one day, he's, he's, he's like behind a rock. And he's talking to his father, and he's crying out to his father. And, and his disciples come up behind him. And they're like, Jesus, excuse me, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to bother you this morning, but, but, but what you're doing, can you like teach us how to do that? In other words, Lord, here it is, teach us to what? Say it pray. You know, we call it the Lord's prayer. It's actually the disciples prayer. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Jesus was turning to the disciples, teaching them how to pray. Isn't it interesting that he was teaching by modeling in the beginning of his ministry, how to pray. And in the end of his ministry, he was teaching by modeling how to pray. I believe that Jesus was showing not just them, but all of us, that when you're going through a hard time, how often is prayer our last resort when it actually should be our first response? How often do we get our lives beat up when we go through, and we try this, and we try this, and we try this? Oh yeah, remember, let's pray. Well, why not do that in the beginning, amen? In other words, let's not have to go through that and that. Let's call out to the Lord. Jesus was modeling for the disciples prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, the beginning of his ministry. This then is how you should pray, our Father. All the way at the end of his ministry, this is how you should pray. He made intercession for the transgressors. I think it's interesting that Jesus was praying for those, again, that were hurting him. He, he was praying for those that were far away from God. It's amazing when we pray, we don't realize that prayer doesn't have boundaries. 
Uh, prayer, prayer, prayer can it can travel to different homes. Prayer can travel to different cities. Prayer can travel to different continents, different nations. Prayer has no boundaries. Prayer, you can pray for a son who's in Iraq. You can pray for a friend who's in uh, wherever, in England. You, you, in other words, prayer doesn't have perimeters and boundaries because God doesn't. I am so grateful for my parents. I'm so grateful for my parents, my, my parents who... Who, who prayed for me when I was a kid. Matter, matter of fact, my mom, you, you guys have heard some of the stories. Some of our guests have it, but my mom's a, she's a prayer warrior, man. They, she had Bible studies and prayer ladies, and they'd be praying for me. Matter of fact, there, there was a Bible study that my mom had for years. And, and the Bible study was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday, strategically designed there to pray, in her words, her words, for her heathen son, Steve. Lauren Dufour, who's in our church today, Lauren Dufour can tell you this. And uh, Lauren Dufour was a younger lady. She was 16, 17 years old at the time. And most of the ladies, they were in their 30s and 40s. And she was a young teenage girl. And she went to this Bible study. And she can tell you the stories that I'd walk in and, and they'd be, and literally, the ladies would literally do this. Literally. They would, my mom would be like, stretch your arms out. Let's pray for my son. He needs prayer. And I'd be like, oh, you ladies are crazy. You know, and I'd just walk by him, you know. And, and I'll never forget the day when they were gone. I thought I finally ran them off. <laughs> and boy, I walked in that room and man, let me tell you something. They had, there was 12, 10, 12 ladies. I mean, they're praying, they're binding the devil, loosen, they're loosened by, I don't know, they're saying all kinds of things. And they're tearing down my, my Led Zeppelin posters. <laughs> Rush 2112, come on 1980s, you know. <laughs> Listen, listen, and they're anointing my, the, my room with oil and all over my Panama Jack shirts. Come on, Panama Jack. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. You cannot, I, I'm going to just tell you this. If you have a mom, a dad, a relative that is praying for you and you're not right with God, you cannot outrun their prayers. How many are grateful for that? You can't. That's a word. That's a word of encouragement for some of you. Some of you have children in a tough place. Don't quit praying for them. Keep standing in the gap. Everybody say, keep standing. He was numbered among the transgressors. And he made intercession for them. Number one, Jesus fulfilled prophecy with that prayer from the cross. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Number two, he modeled the importance of prayer. Number three, Jesus revealed by this prayer man's greatest need. To me, it's interesting what he actually said from the cross. Notice what he said. Now, hear me clearly what I'm about to say. Notice what he said and notice what he didn't say. Here's what he didn't say. Father, heal them. Notice what he didn't say. Father, bless them. Notice what he didn't say. Father, protect them. By the way, God does protect, God does heal, and God does bless. But that's not your greatest need. He revealed with his words from the cross actually what man's greatest need was and is today. And man's greatest need is not healing and blessing and protection. Man's greatest need is forgiveness of their sins. That's what their greatest need is. How many problems do we have today because we don't realize we have a sin problem? And we're trying to do everything we can. By the way, our culture, they can take all the Bibles away. They can prohibit Bibles in school. But prohibit, yeah, they can do, you, can, you, can, you can burn Bibles. You can eradicate. But how many know, listen, you can't run from your conscience. And you're made in the image of God and the likeness of God. And you have a moral conscience. And the reality is when you sin, guilt is a good thing because guilt is something. I'm not talking about shame. Guilt is I made a mistake. Shame is I am a mistake. Guilt said I've done wrong. And when, you've, when you're guilty, you have a guilty conscience, you go to Christ. He forgives you. Only the blood of Christ can wash you of your guilt and sin. And I want to say to you, maybe you're listening to me. One of our locations are online and you don't realize and you've tried to do everything you can. You've tried to run from prayer. You try to do whatever you can. You've tried to say, I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to. But, but the reality is God's, God's, God's bringing you closer to him because he wants to forgive you and help you with your greatest need. And that is forgiveness of your sin. 
You can't rationalize it away. You can't speak it away. You can only repent and ask Christ to wash. How many are grateful the blood of Christ washes you and cleanses you of your sin? On the night of his betrayal, Matthew 26, 28, at the Last Supper, that's what Jesus said. He said, this is my blood. This is my blood of the, of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus revealed our greatest need. And by the way, I think it's important what he said. For they do not know what they're doing. I want, to hear, I want everybody to hear what I'm about to say. Ignorance does not equal innocence. Ignorance does not equal innocence. Don't say that you don't know. You've got a conscience. God is talking to you. God is speaking to you. And we must own the fact that man's fundamental problem, it's not an educational problem, it's not a political problem, it's not a financial problem, it's a sin problem. And when man's sin is dealt with by Christ and we appropriate the blood of Christ to forgive us of our sins, we're born again and we come into a relationship with God and everything changes. Everything changes. Oh, that we would understand the greatest need that we have is forgiveness of sins. How many times in our lives have we often done things to other people and hurt them and we don't know? Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. That happens to us in a relationship. You ever had a relationship with somebody said, and they thought, man, what you said to me hurt me. Like, man, I, I am so sorry. I, I didn't know that. In the same way, in the same way that Jesus is praying a forgiveness prayer, they don't know what they're doing. But how many times in our lives, how many times in our lives are we then made known of something? Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. Maybe it was a word that was said. Maybe it was an action that was done. What do you do? What do you do when you know that you've been wronged? What do you do when you know that you're aware that you've wronged someone else? How do you respond to that? It's two different things, but yet they're connected. What do you do? Let me say it again. What do you do when you've been wronged? And number two, what do you do when you become aware that you've wronged someone else? I want to talk to you about when someone hurts you. What do you do first? Number one, pray for those that have hurt you. In the same way that Jesus modeled it. He modeled prayer in the beginning. He's modeling prayer at the end. What do you do? Pastor, I know what I want to do. I know what I feel like doing. I'm not talking about what do you feel like doing. I'm talking about what do you think you should do, biblically speaking. I know that we often pray for God to get them. That's not biblical. You guys remember the old movie, Bruce Almighty? Smite them, Almighty One, smite them. That, that, that's not biblical. <laughs> we don't pray judgment on our enemy. We don't pray fire come down on them. We, we, we actually pray something different. Luke chapter 6, verse 28, bless those. Everybody say bless. Oh, pastor, come on. Well, that's what Jesus said. These are actually the words of our Lord. Bless those who what? Come on, everybody say it. Curse you. And pray for those who spitefully what? Say it. Use you. Why is that? Because prayer does something in us. Even if prayer doesn't change them, prayer always changes us. It always changes us. <laughs> Think of the accusations. Think of what happened there. Well, I want justice. Let me just say this. We don't want justice from God. We thank you for mercy from God. Now, I understand justice in the earth, but justice from God? Justice from God? You really want justice from God? From God? From God? No, I want mercy. If I say mercy. I'm so grateful he doesn't hold me according to my sin, but I've been forgiven of my sin. That's called mercy. That's not justice. That's mercy. I understand justice in the earth, but I want mercy from God. I want mercy. Everyone say mercy. And we receive mercy from God. We need to extend mercy to others. My, my mom and my dad, many of you at our Little Creek campus know my mom and my dad, and uh, it's my stepdad. He raised me since I was five. And um, my, by, by the way, yesterday was my parents' uh, 50th anniversary, which is really good. Isn't that great? And we, we had a family text, and my dad text, and my mom text, my mom text, we made it, praise the Lord. They both echoed the same thing, you know, praise God. So, so they've been married 50 years, I'm 55. So my, my parents got, they got married when I was five. 
My biological father, who some of you heard a little bit of the story about, and uh, he was part of my life when I was young, and then it was out of my life, and then from 12 to 18, we didn't hear from him. At 18, he came back into our lives, my brother and I, and he was an alcoholic, a drug problem, alcohol problem. He was functional, had a job, but boy, he had a lot of challenges. And I'll never forget when I was 20, on a, on a drunken stupor, he said some horrible things to me, horrible things, cursing, drunk out of his mind, lying, just spewing all kind of accusations and filth against me, blaming me for my mom and him. I mean, just, it was just horrific. And I remember those words. It, it, they, I mean, they really went deep on the inside of me. Finally, I was able to hang up the phone. And I, and I remember, by the way, I remember saying some words. I remember saying this. I will never, ever allow anybody to hurt me like that again. And it was shortly thereafter, probably a week or two, I felt a real heaviness come on my life. About a month or two after that, I literally, I literally felt like there was just like this cloud of oppression that settled in. It was about four or five, six, maybe it was about four or five months after that, that I finally, I drove to a conference in Dallas. I was living in New Orleans at the time and going to college and and I, and I, I went to the, meet this pastor there. And I sat down with the pastor and said, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I just feel like, I just feel like I'm losing my mind. I feel, I don't know what's going on with me. And he, by the spirit of the Lord, was able to bring me back. And he brought me through a series of questions. And he brought me back and he said, and he said, Steve, can I ask you? And he began to unpack that night. He began to unpack with me what happened. And I began to talk to him about, and, and he began to talk about what a bitter root judgment is. When you make a bitter root judgment, it's like the kid who, who sees his dad as an alcoholic as a kid. He goes, I hate him. I'll never be like him. Only for that kid to repeat the same thing. Because there's a bitter root judgment. You, 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 are, you are cursing someone. And you're, there's, a, there's a judgment of the heart where, you're, where, you, where you literally on the inside, you swallow a poison called bitterness. And it was through a series of that night and praying and ministry and the next day of, of really helping me to, first of all, identify. Everyone say identify. Men, let me just say this. Much often of the oppression that somebody is experiencing in their life is because they've opened the door through bitterness and unforgiveness. By, by the way, generational curses go from one generation to the next and it crosses over the bridge called bitterness. How many problems in our lives today? It's because we've got unforgiveness. It's not to suggest that we don't have to have boundaries up with someone that's hurt us. It's not to suggest that we, we can't have a boundary against an alcoholic, but it is to suggest that we can't have bitterness and unforgiveness and hold them in contempt. And I, and I remember when I forgave that night, it was, almost like, it was almost like a weight started coming off of my life. And, and I began to realize something. I begin to realize it's, this is my responsibility. You know, you know what bitterness is? Here it is. It's like you drinking poison and then waiting for the other person to die. That's why Jesus modeled this right at the cross. It, it was such a powerful thing right at the cross. What did he model? Father, forgive them. By the way, good story. My dad got saved on his deathbed. Pastor Jacob Aranza led him to Christ, and now he's in heaven. Come on, how many of y'all are grateful for that? Isn't that powerful? I often wonder if I wouldn't have forgiven him, not only what would have happened to me, but also to him. Who are we holding in captivity because of our unforgiveness? Matthew 5, 43 says, you have it. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love. Everyone say love. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So my question is, who's wronged you? Who has hurt you? Who has wronged you? Who has hurt you? Let me give you this last thing. Number one, we're not only to pray for those that have hurt us. Now watch this. Let's get the flip side here. Remember what I said? There's two questions. One is, who has hurt you? But the second one is, who have you become aware of that you may have hurt? What would the Lord say to us? Pray for reconciliation. 
Forgiveness is a requirement. Reconciliation is a bonus that we should believe for. Let me say that again. Forgiveness is a requirement. Nobody gets off. You've got to forgive. Reconciliation is a bonus. It's a blessing. Because sometimes maybe you've got a parent that's passed away. How do you reconcile there? Forgiveness is a requirement. But when there's an opportunity to reconcile, what would the Lord say? What would Scripture say to us? Reconciliation means to bring back into peace and harmony. It'll often look a little different the second time around where, you're, where, you're, where you've grown in your relationship with God and they've grown in their relationship. But here's what the Scripture says. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Paul says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, if it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, not on them, but as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. You may not know this, but the Romans actually worship the false god of revenge. Isn't that interesting? I want you to hear what I'm going to say again. The Romans actually worshiped a false, the false god of revenge. And Paul says, if it's possible, listen, do whatever you can to try to reconcile that relationship. Some of you have loved ones you haven't talked to in years. They're still alive. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you and let your small group leader and pastors and counselors or whoever give you strategy and wisdom. But if it's possible... If it's, do it ever you can. You know when I find out that I've offended somebody or hurt somebody or, man, I just, I, I've always been like this, by the way. I want to reconcile it. I want to do what I can. What, what do I need to do? And, and, you know, I offend people sometimes. By the way, and, and, and let me qualify something. If I offend you because I preach the truth, that's your problem, not mine. I'm not apologizing for that, okay? And I don't say that. Because you don't have a problem with me, you have a problem with God, if I'm preaching the truth. But if my behavior hurts you, and it's unbecoming to a follower of Christ, and I find out about it, and, and I have a relationship with you, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do, do you know, on our, I mean, I'm telling you, our lead team, our elders, I, I can't tell you how many times I've apologized. If the moment I know, the mo I'll own it, man, I will. I'll say, man, I am so sorry. I, I don't like, how about you? I don't like how it feels when I'm not in re right relationship with somebody. I don't like it. It's just like, ugh, I don't like it. So what do I have to do? What do I, I'm sorry. I, I've even confessed I've done things that I know I didn't even do just to restore a relationship. I really, I was like, I, okay, okay, I did it. I'm so sorry, but please forget. Because I don't want to be out of relationship with those that are around me. If it's possible, if it's possible. So you know what? Some of you guys are going to have to send some texts after this service. Some of you guys are going to have to set up some coffee, some lunches. Maybe it's write a letter. Whatever you have to do. If it's possible, apologize, repent, do what you need to do. Restore. Life is too short to carry around all that baggage. Come on, how many of y'all would say amen to that? How many of y'all would say amen to that? I'll give you this last thing, and this is a big thing for people. I'm just trying to help you today. Has this message been helpful? I hope it's been helpful. All right, let me give you this last thing. Here it is. Well, Pastor Steve, oh, this is a big one. Here it is. I want everybody to look right here. Here it is. Pastor, I'll forgive when I feel like it. Let me just help your blessed assurance. Y'all didn't get that. All right, let me help you out. Here it is. Here it is. You're never going to feel like forgiven. You make a choice. Everyone say, a choice. In other words, activate your will. The problem is some of you guys have been so immobilized because your will is so passive. You've not activated your will in so long. You've got to make a choice. Guess what? When you choose to forgive, then the emotions and the feelings come after the fact. If you wait, here's the problem. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Everybody. 
The problem is, the reason why we often don't forgive is because our identity has been so wrapped around that unforgiveness and that bitterness, we're scared if we forgive, then we actually will cease to being who we think we are. You've been empowered by that unforgiveness. You've been empowered by that judgment for so long. It's so convoluted your personality. You, you're like, you built, you built coalitions around how bad that person is. And now God is saying, lay that down. And you're like, if I lay that down, that's half my personality. I won't be a victim anymore. I won't, be, I, I won't be able to get sympathy anymore. I'll actually have to be a big boy. I'll actually have to be a big, are y'all with me? I'm really talking to somebody. I'm talking to people right now. You'll have to lay that down. Yes, you were hurt. Yes, it was wrong. Yes, it was unjust. Yes, it was painful. But you cannot build your whole identity around a past offense. Yeah, there's a new day for you. Everybody say, choose to forgive. forgive. Colossians 3, last scripture. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance or an offense against someone, forgive. How do I forgive? As the Lord forgave me. As the Lord forgave me. So, ask the Holy Spirit this week. Is there anybody in my heart that I've got in forgiveness? Forgive them. And if it's possible, try to reconcile that relationship. It's not always possible, but and if it's possible, try to reconcile that relationship. Forgive even as Christ has forgiven us. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads. If you do not know Christ, I just sense the Holy Spirit here right now. Matter of fact, I'm going to do something I don't often do. I'm just going to ask you to put your hands on your chest, wherever you are, just you personally, over your own heart. Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask, I ask you right now, This week, Lord, if there's any unforgiveness in my heart towards anybody, oftentimes we we, we need the Holy Spirit to bring it up. Maybe maybe it was a coach or a teacher or an old boyfriend or old girlfriend or something that you've been holding and you don't realize the heaviness in your life. I'm telling you, I had for six months, I had such a cloud of oppression over my life. But when I forgave, when I forgave, It began to lift. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, reveal to us this week, today, who in our lives hurt us that we've not forgiven. And Lord, we promise that when you show us, we will choose to forgive. Yeah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, if you do not know Jesus, If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I want to pray with you. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm not going to do anything today to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand or come forward, but I am going to ask you right where you are in just a moment. If you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me, to cleanse me, and make me new. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know Jesus? Do you know that you know if you die today, you're ready to stand before God? Whoever you are, whatever location you're at, those that are online, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me and to cleanse me. If that's you at the count of three, just put your hand up high so I can see it. One, two, three. Quickly, put your hand up high. God bless you guys up there. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. Pastor, anybody? God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am, right there. Anybody else, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I'm not sure about, God bless you right there. Anybody else, God bless you way up top. Church family, let's pray with those that are trusting Christ right now. Can we pray? Let's all pray together. Say, dear Jesus, I come to you today, a sinner in need of a Savior. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past, and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Say, Jesus, wash with your blood. Give me a new heart, a new life, a new reason to live. I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I take my life and I put it in your hands. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the word of the living God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. Wow, what a powerful message. What an amazing concept, the power that comes from choosing forgiveness. 
And you know, it all started when Jesus gave his life for us on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And if you're making the decision today for the very first time to give your life to Jesus, we just wanna say congratulations. We believe this is the biggest decision you could ever make, and it is the best decision you could ever make. The Bible says that today the old is gone, the new has come. Your sin, your past is no more. You are a brand new creation, and we are just so excited. We are celebrating this moment as you begin your new life with Jesus. Yes, what an incredible new journey with Christ. And we wanna do this journey alongside of you. So you can click the link on your screen or in the chat room. And this lets us know that you have made this decision for Christ today so that we can do it alongside of you. And again, congratulations. Well, guys, can you believe that next weekend is Easter? I just want to say right now, please make sure that you are here for one of our many Easter services. It is going to be such a powerful time yes. celebrating the resurrection of our Savior. And so why don't you even right now begin thinking about who are you going to invite to one of our Easter services? We cannot wait to see you next week. Have a great week. We love you guys.